On the 7th of May, 1903, William Ferguson found a partial dinosaur claw along the Cape Patterson shoreline in Victoria. This theropod claw was the first dinosaur fossil ever found and began over a century of dinosaur paleontology in Australia. And to celebrate the second ever Australian National Dinosaur Day on this date, I thought I'd talk about what could possibly be not only Australia's first known fossil, but the country's first unearthed dinosaur fossil. Now it might surprise many of you to hear this, but Australia and Russia actually have a very long history, and it's one you very rarely hear about. If we go back to the time of Peter the Great, not only was he greatly expanding his empire at the time, he modernised his nation and its society by hiring Western experts, and he helped create the Imperial Russian Navy. And this is an important point, because it's the Navy that we will discover that were constantly visiting the early colonies like Botany Bay. He also had a great interest in what has been called the Fifth Continent deep in the Southern Hemisphere at the time, and the Tsar reportedly sent a number of explorations to find this mysterious land, but none of these managed to make their way all the way south. So the first reported Russian ship to arrive in the Botany Bay colony was the warship Neva in 1807. Now these Russians were under the command of Leonti Andranovich Gagmeister, and the Neva had recently completed the Empire's first circumnavigation of the globe, and was on its way to Russia America, Alaska to you and me, and was there to deliver cargo to the Russian settlements that were occupying this region. Since the 1770s, the Russian American company had been flourishing in the North Pacific, and this was a state-sponsored project to encourage and support Russia's colonization of Alaska, and that meant Russia had two outposts in the Pacific. Now, the Neva had originally been purchased by the Royal Navy, which Gagmeister had spent some time working for. It turns out the Russian royals were related to the British and German monarchies, and there is a lot of sharing of resources between all three during the 18th century. For example, many British explorers like Joseph Billings, who'd learnt their trade under Captain Cook, ended up heading explorations for Catherine the Great. When England was not at war, the Royal Navy shrank in size, and many of its officers, especially those who weren't strongly connected, ended up serving for other foreign navies who were keen to have them because these were some of the best sailors on the planet. You might be surprised to hear the most famous of these was the founder of Botany Bay, Arthur Phillip, who spent much of his service sailing for the Portuguese navies around Brazil, fighting the Spanish. Now, during his circumnavigation of the planet, Gagmeister had crossed the Atlantic and reached Brazil, and it was here that he came to the conclusion that to carry on without any stops in the Pacific was far too dangerous. Turns out the newly established British colony in Australia was just the thing to rest, pick up so much supplies, and so off he set across the biggest ocean in the world. The Neva first sighted Van Diemen's Land after a three-month voyage across the Pacific, but as Hobart at the time was little more than a collection of tents, the Russians moved on north to Sydney. Here they slipped into Neutral Bay, where most foreign ships were assigned to anchor, and the Russian sloop fired a broadside to salute their new host. Unfortunately, they were arriving during one of the most dangerous times in the colony, the Rum Rebellion, which would lead to the overthrow of the New South Wales governor, William Bly. And yes, for those of you who know history, that's the same Bly from the Mutiny on the Bounty. In fact, this was his third rebellion. Now, the actual capture of Bly by his own troops was actually some time off, and the Russians arrived and found the growing city a wonder to behold. They were shocked to discover that this brand new colony that had been created basically on the other side of the planet was clean, was full of very well constructed buildings, and they found themselves surprised at what the British had already completed, and they began reporting on the settlement. For example, they wrote, This settlement is in initial condition, though surprisingly much has been done. Apart from Sydney, the towns of Parramatta and Hawkesbury have been founded, and coal is mined at the Hunter Valley near the sea coast. The inner part of this vast land, barred by the highest mountains, is yet unexplored. Despite the fact that the Rum Rebellion was still some time off, the Russians did notice the growing tensions in the outpost. For years, the wealthy and most powerful men in the colony, which were generally the officers of its military, had been buying goods straight off any boat that visited the colony. They then sold these to Sydney's poor and struggling at massively marked up prices. Gagmeister was horrified at the prices he was being quoted in the colony, and later wrote, Everything is excessively expensive here, and he was keen to leave without buying anything more than what was absolutely necessary. In an attempt to break up this monopoly by the soldiers, the British had assigned the no-nonsense Bly as governor. This naval officer had been doing his utmost to destroy the black market, and had begun return pricings to a more reasonable level. Unfortunately, most of the ringleaders were the very guards Bly needed to enforce his will. Thus, something of a standoff was underway in the colony when the Russians arrived. Now, during their two-week stay in the harbour, the Russians eventually met all the major players in this bloodless rebellion, including John MacArthur and the Reverend Samuel Marsden. Though much of the intricate power struggle that was going on in the colony was most likely lost on the Russians at the time, they are a very important eyewitness to the work Bly was doing. Especially as these days, Bly is looked at as one of the instigators that he was too heavy-handed, 
But what they reported was that the governor was doing hard work and his efforts on behalf of the colonists was likely to increase the value of this settlement. Though the colony shopkeepers were unhappy at how little the Neva purchased, when the sloop finally sailed out of Sydney Harbour, the Russians were still given a warm farewell. The next Russians to arrive in Sydney Harbour were in 1814. And to show you how isolated Botany Bay was at the time, the frigate Sovorov brought news of Napoleon's defeat. Now before any of these Russians could even set foot on shore, they received a royal salute from the colony's shore batteries in honour of Russia's part in the French Emperor's defeat. Now, Russian and English relationships have been quite friendly up until this point. But with the defeat of Napoleon, the spirit of cooperation between these two countries started to peter out. Russia was growing in influence around the world, and especially in European politics. When more and more Russian ships began arriving in Australian waters, the government in England and New South Wales started to become concerned about their intentions in the Pacific. For example, in short order, the Vostok and the Mirny arrived in 1820. They were followed in 1823 by the Rurik and the Apollon. In 1824, the Ladoga and the Kreiser arrived in 1825, and then later in 1829, the Eleanor pulled into shore. And finally, in 1828, the Krotsky and the America, which also returned in 1831 and 1835. Now the 1829 visit by Krotky was commanded by our old friend Leontny Gagmeister and he was on a purely scientific expedition and been travelling around the southern hemisphere discovering things like the Menshikov Atoll and the Marshall Islands. Now among these discoveries the Russians actually calculated the exact geographical location of Sydney which had never been calculated before their visit. These explorers had only planned to stay in the colony for a few days but due to the overwhelmingly warm reception they received and the need to do some minor repairs to their ships the Russians decided to stay on for three weeks. This would be the last time Australians were so welcoming to Russian expeditions, as the world at that time was changing. Russia and England were starting to fray against the traditional alliance, and this was a strain that would soon erupt in the Crimea War. Russia would also later crush the Polish November uprisings, and even in those days of old, Australians loved an underdog, and so their natural sympathies were with, of course, the struggling Poles, not with the mighty Russians. This attitude towards the Russians wasn't helped by the British reports indicating that the Northern Empire was one of the few powers left in the world that could move into the Pacific and actually threaten Australia, especially with the ongoing Crimea War raging up in the North. This fear of a Russian invasion is often cited as the excuse for Australia building a number of forts along its key ports, including the impressively placed Fort Denison in Sydney Harbour. The Russians, and even the French to some extent, were a major concern for the fledgling country, full of colonies that were well out of range of any help from its grand protector, England. Now it's important to note that never was there any hint of any attention from the Russians other than the reasons they offered for visiting, which was most of these were scientific missions. They were actually trying to look for things and prove things and explore. And with that, the expedition of Fabian Gottlieb von Bellinghausen in 1820 is of very special interest here. He arrived on the ships Vostok and Mirny, and this Russian voyage was the first one to enter the Antarctic Circle since James Cook in 1773. And importantly, Bellinghausen reached the mainland of Antarctica, though there was some troublesome ice fields in the region that stopped him from actually landing on it. But what this does mean is that Bellinghausen was the first to prove that Captain Cook was actually wrong. Cook had claimed no actual land would ever been found in the south, and Bellinghausen had just found it. For the first time, the long sought after Terra Australis the great southern continent that Peter the Great was interested in had been found, and had been found by a German-born Russian. And for his efforts, Bellinghausen would receive almost no acclaim for his discovery. I mean, have you ever heard of Bellinghausen? Today he's been all but forgotten. So this is all pretty interesting, but what does this have to do with Australia's National Dinosaur Day? Well, in the months before Bellinghausen arrived, Port Jackson was visited by the two Russian sister ships of his own fleet. Now, I've got to admit, over the years, very little has ever been written about these vessels. And I am going to have trouble saying these names, so please bear with me, especially if you know Russian. I'm doing my best. These two ships were the warship Blagina Marini under Mikhail Vasiliev. Now, these had sailed from Kronstadt in 1819 to not only visit the Russian colonies in Alaska, but to search and map the route between the Pacific and the Bering Sea. All vessels had remained together as they visited South America, but in Rio, Bellinghausen's two ships sailed south to discover Antarctica while Vasilevi's ships headed across the Pacific to Sydney. Like all the other Russian visitors at the time, the crew of this expedition were inundated with parties and dinner invitations and seemed to have had a wonderful time during their stay. So much so that a number of their sails seemed to have gone missing when the ships left. But while in the colony, the ship's officers, scientists and doctors spent a lot of time exploring, experimenting and ensuring they kept to their primary mission, 
Now here, some of the scientists studied anthropology, and they began studying the natives of the Southern Hemisphere. Now before sailing, Bellinghausen had been advised by his commanders, when you're in foreign countries or amongst natives, deal kindly with all and observe every courtesy and politeness, instilling the same into the minds of your subordinates. To this end, when the Russians arrived, they made sure to visit one of the most famous Aborigines of the day, King Bungaree. Now Bungaree was of the Karingo people of Broken Bay around the northern parts of Sydney, and he was known as an explorer, and he's highly significant because he was the very first person to be recorded in print as an Australian, a person literally from Australia. He'd also proved to be the first Australian to circumnavigate the continent when he joined Matthew Flinders in 1803 as he sailed on the investigator to map the continent. Now the Russian's expedition artist would later paint Bungaree and his wife, and in fact they went on to create a number of paintings depicting the locals in a very warm, in fact noble light. Now the Russians also built an observatory for their astronomer, and a number of men went searching around the area, especially with their doctor, Grigory Zalzersky. At Newcastle, this Russian team noticed the coal seams there, which have been opened up here, represent an, an immense deposition of botanical fossils. In slaty clay, often stems and leaves of reeds occur. Reportedly while they were there, and to quote, he was fortunate to find skeletons of two animals which belonged to already extinguished species. These skeletons were later dispatched to Russia and handed over to the Academy of Sciences, along with a number of other specimens which represented ethnographic and biological interest. This is from a website called AustraliaRussia.com. Today we know the Sydney Basin is mostly made up of Permian and Triassic sandstone. Now this was a time where there were certainly very large animals around. The most famous of these was an enormous amphibian called Paracyclodosaurus. Think of a crocofrog, or maybe a frogodile. These were giant amphibians that did look a lot like crocodiles. And a complete skeleton was found in Sydney in a brick quarry in 1910. Now while they are in the colony, the scientist Fedor Ivanovich Stein and the artist Emilian Kranev decided to see some of the interior of the country. Now they would not face this land alone. They went and talked to some of Australia's earliest explorers, like William Lawson, and the botanist, Alan Cunningham. Now, sadly, there is very little left of their journey. The artist had been ordered to make sketches of any notable place, drawings of the natives, of their dress and amusements. But much of his art has actually been lost over the years. Now, Cunningham had just lately returned from surveying territory in the north with Captain Philip Parker King, and together they headed to the distant Blue Mountains. Now, since its formation, the potential of the Australian colony had been hemmed in by these distant mountains, which make up a part of the Great Dividing Range that cuts down the entire east coast of the continent. Now, though we know a convict had crossed the range around 1798, officially these Blue Mountains were not crossed until 1813, and so they'd only just been breached by the time the Russians got there. The problem is the Russians had only been given 12 days to get to these mountains and back and Stein would later write a paper about all they saw on this journey and what they uncovered, mineralogical remarks on a 12-day trip from Sydney through Parramatta to the so-called Blue Mountain. Though the group did not cross this geological border, Stein did manage some geological investigations and arrived at the idea that the Blue Mountains were quite ancient, and he was anxious to confirm this by analysis and observation. Stein also found traces of iron and even gold at the foot of the mountains. Though this was not widely reported at the time, as there was a great fear that letting the thousands of convicts in the colony know there was gold to be found close by could actually end in a massive revolution. The discovery of gold is important, but it is one passage of Stein's report that is possibly of greater significance to us, and it shows a geological connection to these distant mountains. On the northern shore of Port Jackson, and at particularly at the harbour's entrance, there are colossal quite perpendicular or extensive cliff-like bare walls. Around Parramatta and Sydney, many sandstone quarries yield building material for houses, mills, garden walls, lining the ditches, gutters, sewers, bridges, etc. Quite frequently, we are told, fossil shells are found in it. On the sea coast, at the height of more than 100 yards, time has uncovered some parts of the sandstone and thus exposed to the curious observer an entire museum of the ancient world, which unfortunately cannot be seen closely because of the steepness of the cliff. In one bay at Port Jackson, not far from the location of our observatory, Mr. Zausaskoy, the staff surgeon, found during low tide two quite big rib bones. According to the nature of these bones, since the external as well as the internal composition was damaged, we concluded that they had been in the water for a long time. The bone ends were absent, and they were covered thickly by shells and oysters. It is possible that these ribs belonged to some ancient animal and were washed out by water from the coastal sandstone. 
This occurrence should be considered as an uncommon phenomenon in New Holland, as up to now no animal had been discovered in which these ribs could be attributed. Rarely reported, here we have the first discovery of not only large fossil bones in Australia, but the first vertebrate fossils ever unearthed on the continent. Before this, only plants and shells have been discovered. These important fossils left our shores, never to be seen again, or more accurately, they have been left on some unfrequented shelves at the Academy of Sciences in Russia. This of course is a story that occurs again and again in the maelstrom of grand discoveries from this mysterious continent. Small discoveries were easily overlooked, and most of them seem to have been lost in time or sent overseas to the more prestigious institutions like the London Natural History Museum. In the 1820s, no animal had been discovered to which these ribs could be attributed was an accurate description of Australia's natural history, but very soon remains would be found in and around Sydney that easily fit the bill for the owner of these quite big rib bones. Now it has been suggested they were merely the remains of a whale, and most certainly the remains of whales have been the source of many mysterious creature fossils. This may be the case here, but many of these men were professional sailors, and many had worked in one of the most lucrative sources of income at the time, whaling. If anyone would have known what whale bones looked like, it was a 19th century sailor. So to my mind there are of course another possibility for these bones. Not only are there the giant amphibian fossils found in the very same sandstone that caught the eye of Stein, but the Triassic did hold some very large dinosaurs such as Platyosaurus. Now we already have a possible Platyosaurus discovered in Australia, though there is still a lot of conjecture around this. These fossils were found by the HMS Fly in northern Queensland, and we will be talking about the new evidence about these fossils later, but the point is that there is a chance that these dinosaurs did live in the region and they had just been discovered by the Russians. The Russians themselves believe these large rips had eroded out of the sandstone cliffs along Sydney Harbour. And we know that these cliffs are Triassic Age rocks, so there is a chance they could belong to a dinosaur, making them Australia's first. Now we won't know anything until somebody gets into the Russian Academy of Sciences and locates these fossils. And not just those, remember there are two skeletons of animals that were found a bit earlier also up there. And I've never seen any images of them, I don't think anybody has. Hopefully all of these fossils are still sitting somewhere up on some dusty shelf in the Russian Academy of Sciences, just waiting for somebody to come along and rediscover them. If there is anyone from Russia, or anyone who knows a Russian paleontologist listening, please pass on this story to them and ask them to go have a look and let us know what they find. Maybe we can rediscover a long lost dinosaur fossil, Australia's first. So there we have it, a possible dinosaur fossil unearthed by a Russian expedition before the first actual dinosaur, Megalosaurus, was even named in 1821. This potentially is a very important discovery, and I'm hoping somewhere out there will be able to help us extend this story. So that's it, that's my story about the first possible dinosaur bones discovered in Australia. If anybody out there knows anything from an earlier discovery that I don't know about or haven't mentioned, please let us know. It is Australia's National Dinosaur Day after all, and this is what we're here to do. We're here to talk about these things. So there you go, Australian National Dinosaur Day. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I hope you also head out to your local museum, give them some support. Australian museums always need your help, and we always need to work on our history because it's always evolving. There's new things being discovered about old things all the time, and it's changing the story of the continent for the better. So thank you very much, and, and I hope to hear from you soon.